Welcome back everyone to part two of the template series. Um, today we're going to be talking about the DAW setup. So once your VE Pro MetaFrame is all set, you can go into your digital audio workstation. It can be Logic, can be Cubase, can be Pro Tools, can be Digital Performer, Reaper, doesn't really matter. Um, whichever one works for you. I know there are many debates about which one you should use. Um, there are pros and cons to all of them, and honestly, it doesn't matter. Whichever one works best for you. The first thing I did in my Cubase template was um, to set up, you know, very basic stuff. Like in some DAWs, you can set up colors, which I find very pleasant because you're going to be looking at the software for a long time every day. Um, you set up key commands, um, however you like. Um, I'd advise you to go through all of them or most of them and see what's what key commands are out there and which ones are useful to you because I still sometimes find very specific things that I can assign key commands to and I'm, I go, oh man, I wish I had known that, you know, five years ago <laughs> that I could just assign a key command to this. It just saves so much time. I would also advise you to go through the settings menu, um, set up your audio interface, your buffer size, how you want certain things to behave. For example, when you cut a MIDI region, I like it to cut all the MIDI data as well. Specific naming schemes that, for example, a MIDI region or audio region is automatically named after the track name or that, you know, colors correspond. You know, it's um, whatever you want set up set it up right there in the settings. Just go through every single menu and just select whatever you want. For example, something I also like to have is when I click on a region that the track automatically gets selected. All of these little behavioral things you will find in these menus. So um, really go through it and select everything you want. You can also set up so-called macros, but that's really just, at least in Cubase, um, but that's really getting into it. That would be kind of the equivalent of also going into the logic environment. Um, I, I think that would lead too far for this video because it's so specific to this DAW. So let's not get into that right now. Now, once you've set up the you know general look and behavior of the DAW and the audio interface and all this stuff, your MIDI controller, anything hardware-wise that you need connected, Every patch that you've loaded into Vienna Ensemble Pro needs a MIDI track, of course. So you're going to have to go in and actually create a MIDI track for every single thing, name it properly. I usually name it by the uh, library. I give every library a shortcut so I know, you know, what flute it is or what horn patch it is. Um, I name it by the instrument and then I name any specifics. Um, what you will see, for example, is a percentage sign very often for mod wheel capabilities, um, or I sometimes put in key switch range if I'm using key switches or what the key switches are for, something like that. Um, anything that you want. You can also put that in the track description, of course. And then the next thing, once you have done this, which is gonna take quite a bit of time, um, you might also want to color code the tracks, of course, just to create more, um, create a better overview. And then you also need to activate the outputs in the Vienna Ensemble Pro plugin that you want to use. So if you go here in Cubase and you click on this little arrow, you can activate the outputs that you've used. Remember how in the last one we assigned, you know, one and two, for example, to the flutes in the first Vienna Ensemble Pro instance? And then in the second instance, it would be trumpets. So you also need to activate one and two in the second instance for the trumpets and so forth. You need to activate all the, uh, all the outputs that you have used in the Vienna Ensemble Pro MetaFrame. And you can, um, in, in Cubase at least, you can uh, create as many outputs as you like. And then every time you activate one of those outputs, a, a group track is created. In Cubase. In Logic, it would be an aux channel, pretty much. In any other DAW, it's an aux channel. Just in Cubase, it's called group track. I don't know why. It's an aux channel. So you can see down here already how every Vienna Ensemble Pro instance got its outputs assigned. And then I just name them by whatever the output stands for. So now you can see all the flutes that I have loaded, no matter what library, 
the sound is going to come out of this output. And all of the oboes and all the English horns I have loaded are going to come out of this output, and so forth. Then the next thing you want to do is set negative track delays. Here we go. Uh, this has been such a common question, and uh, I've been dodging it in the comments because um, it would take a long time to explain. So negative track delays, when you edit samples as a sample developer, um, you cut the sample right where the audio starts, and then whoever is managing the whole sampling deal is going to tell you um, we are going to pull back all the sustains by this and that many samples or this and that many milliseconds. So everybody cuts for cohesion, everybody cuts right onto where the sample starts, but in order to give some headroom and to avoid clicks and pops and, you know, accidentally cutting off the actual, you know, sample start, um, you pull it back a little bit. But what does that do, of course? It results in there being a slight delay in, um, in the sample start. And so in order to compensate for that, you go into the MIDI tracks and you set a negative track delay onto it. Now, in every library, it's different. And in every articulation, it's different. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons why I do not use um, patches that have all the articulations in one, um, in one track. But we're going to get to that later. There are way different ways you can figure out what the negative track delay needs to be. First of all, you can just turn on the click and use your ears. So you can just program a line, set it right into the grid, and then um, turn on the click, play it back, and then increase the negative track delay until you feel like everything is right on the click. You can also bounce out the audio and then just look at the gap there is between um, the grid and the actual uh, audio file, uh, audio waveform start. Or you can uh, read the manual. I know, mind-blowing, but a lot of developers actually put that information into their manuals. Or um, some developers also put it into their walkthrough videos. I think Alex Wallbank does that. At least that's how I heard about his negative um, track delay values, it was in, I think in his walkthrough video, that where he just explains the different legatos and stuff. Um, so yeah, the information is either out there or just use your ears. Uh, always, always trust your ears. Um, another thing, uh, now that you have set all the negative track values, which is going to take forever, by the way, um, you also have to set up the volumes because different libraries have different loudness. Some libraries are normalized, other libraries are not normalized. Some libraries are super soft. Um, other libraries are fairly loud. So um, you want the libraries that you're going to be using um, to be roughly the same loudness, of course. So pick whichever one you want and then adjust all the remaining libraries to that volume. And also amongst the instruments, sometimes I notice that, you know, one patch is much louder than another patch in the same library. Um, so this is where I adjust that. Um, by default, I just set the value, the volume value to 90, and then um, I go from there. So some patches I need to make much softer because the library is too loud. Some patches I need to make louder because the library is much softer than what I want to hear. Uh, you basically have to um, decide on a base loudness and then adjust everything to that. Then you set up the MIDI flags. I have a whole video on MIDI flags. Um, but yeah, it's these little regions here at the beginning of each track, which is just one bar long or a couple of beats long where basically all the controllers get reset to some default value that I determine. You can determine yours. Um, however you want the, um, the patches to default back to whatever velocity and whatever loudness, etc., to whatever articulation, um, you would save that information in that MIDI flag. Then something else I've also done is set some MIDI modifiers um, for any type of instruments that have uh, octave transposition. 
for example, the piccolo flute or, for example, the double basses. So, as you might know, the flute and piccolo flute are notated the same way, but the piccolo flute sounds an octifier. Same with the basses, they are notated in the same exact range as the cellos, but the double basses sound an octave lower. Um, different libraries map that out differently. So some libraries map the basses where they actually sound an octave lower, but some libraries also map the basses where the celli are, but then they sound an octave lower. So it's really confusing if you're mixing different libraries and they all handle it differently. So uh, you will find that I have MIDI modifiers on some of these so that um, basically they all act the same way. So some of these automatically read an octave higher or lower so that I can just copy paste from one into the other without having to manually do the, the um, octave drop. And then I've touched on that, you need to choose how you want your patches to work. Ideally, you've already chosen that in your VE Pro Metaframe, but do you want to use key switches to switch articulations? Do you want to use expression maps? Do you want split articulations, which is mostly what I have? Do you want articulations to switch through using the mod wheel? I mean, um, whatever you want. Uh, Cine Samples has a velocity mapping feature. Um, if you like that, some people hate that, some people love that, some people love expression maps, others don't like expression maps. Uh, I have personal opinions about this stuff, but there's no right or wrong. Um, I don't like expression maps and key switches personally, because I personally have not found a library where you could have all the articulations on one track and still have them be in time. Because when you're working on a movie, you usually try and work as much in the grid as you can because you're going to be making a lot of MIDI edits. So this whole nudging MIDI notes manually is A, too time consuming, and B, what, the moment you make MIDI edits, you have a complete mess. You can't really do that. So um, you try to work in the grid as much as you can so that means you have to work with negative track delays, but you can only set one negative track delay onto a track. But normally, uh, long articulations, for example, will have a different negative track delay than short articulations. And sometimes even within those, um, you know, there are some variations. So I can't really have everything on one track because one of the articulations, at least, would always be out of whack with the rest of the orchestra and it would sound completely messy. So that's why I can't use expression maps. Um, as you can see, I like to split things out. Sometimes, if a library allows for it, I will have all the short articulations on one track, and then I will use um, either the velocity mapping or I will use the, uh, in the strings, I have them all set up to use uh, the mod wheel values. Um, but I will always have long articulations definitely split away from the short articulations, at the very least, because it just doesn't work for me to have all of those in one track. But if it works for you, that's fine. And I also don't like key switches. I've worked with key switches a lot in, in, at other people's studios, and it's always a mess for the same reason that you don't want to manually move you know, notes too much out of the grid, because um, you have the key switches switching between articulations. First of all, you have that problem again with a negative track delay. But secondly, now you have the issue, you get a new cut, you have to conform a cue, you edit MIDI regions, and you're accidentally cutting out a key switch. And now the right articulations aren't triggered anymore. And I've spent so many days of my life as an assistant fixing sessions where, uh, you know, a composer had done quick edits to do a conform and then accidentally cut out a bunch of key switches. And now it was up to me to figure out, you know, what those key switches are and, you know, where they need to be. And, you know, it's, it's a mess. It just, um, it invites problems that I don't want to have when I'm in a time crunch. Um, 
if you do use key switches, I would advise you to try and assign them the same way throughout all of the libraries at least, so that you always know, you know, this key is, you know, legados, and this key is specados, and this key is always, you know, marcados, something like that. Cohesion is key, so I would always try and set up all the libraries the same way. Now, one more thing I have in here is project-specific instruments. Um, I have certain things I have loaded in here, usually keys and plugs and stuff that I just want in my DAW session every single time I boot it up, um, stuff that I use for quick sketching so that I, if for some reason my other machine is turned off and I don't have all the samples loaded, I still have samples loaded in here that I can just quickly use to sketch out an idea. Um, but then also project-specific instruments, I would normally load into the DAW or queue-specific instruments. You know, sometimes you have a queue and for some reason you need a guitar or something that you didn't need in any of the other queues. That just gets loaded into the session locally. I don't uh, load that into the Vienna Ensemble Pro Metaframe. And also things that need to change all the time, uh, like synthesizers, for example, or just stuff that um, where you really need to see the interface and where you use the patch in a very unique way every single time. Um, usually that's not orchestral patches, but those are also loaded locally. Then once you're done with all this setup, um, you have to set up the lanes at the top. Normally I have, what, what do I have there? The tempo track, the marker track, the picture track, the meter track, and um, whatever else you want, really. It, it doesn't matter. It's whatever you want. These are the most common ones that you will see. And then the last thing you would determine is the music start. Uh, you don't ever start in bar one. You start music at bar three, or some people like bar five. Some extreme examples would be like bar 15 or something, but you always leave headroom, at least two bars of headroom at the beginning of each cue. So that should be uh, set up right there with a marker that this is where the music starts. So your orchestrator would always see that. I hope this was helpful. I hope I didn't forget anything right now with the setup of the um, settings and the MIDI tracks. Um, if I did or if something was unclear, drop it in the comments and I will try to answer it there.